Hello, everyone. I think we are now live. Um, I've got Dan Norris with me. He's one of Labour's mayoral candidates. Um, and we're going to be talking about Dan, just getting to know him. We're going to be talking about the mayoral campaign that he's running and, of course, the elections that are coming up in May. So uh, let's just start with talking about how are you? And well, how has the coronavirus pandemic been like for you? Like, how's it changed your day to day life? Well, the lucky thing I have, Sienna, and hello, everybody who's tuning in and, and listening. Um, I, I suppose because I'm in a semi rural area, it's kind of a little bit different than perhaps other parts of the country. So you're kind of more isolated. And that has two aspects to it, I suppose. The first one is it allows you to go for a walk, which is lovely, and you really appreciate the opportunity to just get out because I think that's driving a lot of people stir crazy and getting us all very blue that we can't always do that and don't have the opportunities to do that. Um, but on the other hand, um, the remoteness also brings in a few issues. It's hard to get your shopping uh, and that kind of thing. So it, it, it's a mixed bag, really. Uh, but I think it's been a, a very tough time for a lot of people for approaching a year now. Uh, and I, I don't know if, if uh, people watching now would agree, but I think this is a tougher phase now than it's been at any stage, because I think many of us are finding psychologically that there are challenges. So so I hope you're all okay. And, and, and I hope that today's chat will help lift you and, and make you think about more positive things about the future than what we've been going through in the last 12 months. Yeah, I hope so too. So I've been doing this series of in conversation events and it started out when kind of Keir Starmer was first elected as like an, a way of introducing kind of new shadow cabinet members to people. And then I kind of got onto front benches as well. And now it's really about talking to, to candidates ahead of those May elections. We've got Labour's um, campaign launch coming up soon. Um, no details yet, but <laughs> they will come soon. Um, but yeah, so I just wanted to kind of talk about First of all, you, just getting to know you a little bit more, because, of course, you were an MP for really quite a long time, um, from 97 to 2010. But tell me about what were you doing before you became an MP, and then we can go on to the rest of it as well. I've, I've read that you were you were a teacher at one point. You were also a child protection officer, which is something that you're particularly interested I in. I was, yeah. I mean, that's children have always been um, very important to me in their welfare and their life, you know, they're doing well and, and surviving in what is a tough world very often for children. Um, uh, and I've always felt that they need good people in their lives more than anybody because they can't go to lawyers or, or politicians or whatever as young people uh, or children um, when they need help. So I've always felt it's very, very important. So I was very lucky I got a really good training by the NSPCC um, in East London. Uh, which taught me a great deal about some very difficult things that you have to address when it comes to child protection. And I won't go into those too much, but people will understand. Um, and it's a hugely important job. And I think that training was a wonderful thing, not just for me hopefully doing a better job as a child protection officer when I was in the Bristol area and the southwest of England actually practicing, but also I think in terms of Politics, I think it gives you a great self-discipline. I think it gives you a great focus. I think you have to know what your priorities are. You have to expect the unexpected. You have to remain in control and calm when things are very difficult and tough. So I, th I think it was a great training for life as well as uh, for doing a job. So so I, I remember that very fondly. Um, but what I, what I realize is that, um, that there's still so much to do with, in terms of children and their welfare. Though. I mean, uh, although great, strides have been made in some respects. There are still many more uh, poor children, uh, children in need, children with neglect as well as abuse. Uh, there's a huge challenge there. And I certainly, if I become Metro Mayor, want to talk about those issues just as I did in the past to help bring about the important solutions that we need to make children's lives better. Yeah, I'm just going to remind everyone who's watching that if you're if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or any of those things, just reply or comment or anything like that, and it will come through to us. And then I can put some of those questions to Dan as well. So, yeah, I mean, you were a teacher as well. And I was wondering what you thought of. I mean, there's been so many questions around education and obviously schools being open, being closed blended learning all the kind of various options there in terms of how we keep kind of you know the limit the kind of impact on the educational attainment gap all of those sort of issues that Keir Starmer actually is particularly interested in as well what was your kind of view of all those debates around trying to 
trying to keep schools open as long as possible and then being kind of the last to close, the first to open, all of that sort of thing? Well, I, I do think that um, teachers need to be listened to as, as well as other teaching staff. I mean, it's not just teachers. There are other experts who do a great job for our children in our schools. Um, uh, and, and even the cleaning personnel do an amazing job supporting children a lot of the time too. Yeah, so I think we really do need to listen to their wisdom and experience because I think that it's been a bit dismissive sometimes of the professionals who've done not just the teaching role, but actually a large childcare role to make sure our essential workers could carry on doing the jobs that they needed to protect us and keep us going if we unfortunately end up in the hospital or whatever it might be. So they've done an absolutely pivotal role. And I suppose my real feeling is that those people, teachers, uh, teaching assistants and, and, and the others in schools, as well as all the other public sector workers who've done important jobs and including those who've worked in, in vital services like supermarkets providing food for us uh, and making sure the, the shelves are stopped have uh, really had uh, an amazing pandemic in that they pulled out all the stops to do the right thing by, them, by the country. Uh, and I feel very grateful to them. So I'm particularly horrified um, by the government's very low uh, wage proposal for nursing staff and NHF staff in general. Uh, and I do think they made a grave error there. I think they will inevitably have to U-turn on that. Um, I really do think, uh, I don't know how many people watching now will have seen the Banksy um, uh, image that he's auctioning to raise money for the NHS, but it's an absolutely super thing that he's got this sort of drawing of a child holding up a superhero figure, which is a nurse. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic. Uh, and, you know, part of his auctioning that, uh, that picture to raise money for NHS is also to say what heroes the NHS staff have been. Uh, and, and I just think that really does reflect the feelings of the public and I think the, the government have misjudged that completely uh, and particularly as the rollout with vaccination has been entirely down to the efficiency and skill and talents of NHS staff. I mean they are the ones who've delivered that let's be honest when it's been left to the government to make any decisions they completely messed up on track or trace or all the other things that have been disastrous and, and there's uh, new figures coming out um, or just come out showing how we performed the worst when uh, it came to preventing the disease. And in consequence, not only has that been terrible for those who've lost their lives or been ill, but actually has a huge negative impact on our economy. And we are the lowest in the G9 and the G20 pretty much at the bottom too. So it has been an absolutely poorly handled pandemic with the exception of the great work of the NHS staff. And I'm very proud of them. And I, I certainly believe they deserve a, a much bigger increase than they're being offered at the moment. Absolutely. I mean, it's clearly going to be a key campaigning issue for, for Labour in the next few months. And obviously something that Keir was talking about today at PMQs as well, just hammering home the fact that, you know, 1% wasn't what they were promised even before the pandemic. And it's gone down after their hard work during COVID, which is quite incredible, really. Well, it's kind of worse than that, Cindy, because I think that what the managers of the NHS have said was that they kind of had a nod that they were going to have at least 2% anyway. So it's actually a reduction in what they were expecting. So uh, the, the, the government have uh, deliberately intervened in a way that I think is very disrespectful. I mean, it's one minute they want to clap NHS staff when it suits their purposes. Uh, and the next minute they're giving them a slow hand clap by giving them such low wage increases that are effectively a real terms cut. So it, it is a pretty important really. Yeah. Uh, so as I said earlier, I mean, you were, you were an MP from 97 to 2010. And I wanted to ask you a bit about a bit about that time in terms of kind of what you learned from being an MP and why you're now kind of interested in standing for a, a mayoral role rather than say trying to get back into parliament or something like that. Well what, what that experience obviously gives you is an amazing uh, first-hand knowledge of how the system works and, and I think that's something that Metro mayors uh, really do get an advantage from. I, I guess people could do it without that experience, but it's a lot easier to have that because, you know, power is, is something that's jealously guarded and people don't give it up easily. And you need to understand exactly who's really the one believers. And, you know, one of the things that I appreciated was that, yes, politicians do make lots of decisions ultimately, but they're often influenced by their special advisors who give them briefings and guidance and, and, and advice. Uh, and so knowing how that system works is really, really important. And uh, in my area, um, in the West of England, the incumbent Metro Mayor, who's a Conservative, uh, and we narrowly came second to the Tories last time, um, has been pretty bad, really. Uh, he has not shown any leadership. He has not 
uh, brought in extra money. He has not worked the system to benefit the local communities of which I'm very proud and, and, and grateful to be part of. Every opportunity that I've ever had has come from the communities across the West of England and, and I feel indebted to them. And to think that we've had a Metro Mayor who's done so little and effectively let us fall behind many, in many ways, the rest of the country appalls me. And I'm absolutely determined to turn that around. And I think that experience of being in Parliament um, is really, really helpful as well as being a government minister. It just teaches you what you need to know about how decisions are made and how, therefore, you can impact them to bring about what you want. I mean, you, you were elected uh, to that constituency under, obviously, Tony Blair's leadership, and, and then you left in, in 2010. Would you say that you come from a particular wing of the Labour Party? Like, I, I was recently interviewing Anas Sawa. He's very you know, proud of the fact that he just calls himself a brownite quite openly. Do you, would you ascribe to any kind of label like that to yourself? No, I'm a, I'm a if, if anything, I'm a, a marginal seat fighting Labour person because I've never known easy contests. So my battles have always been against the Tories throughout a whole range of different times, uh, including when Margaret Thatcher was in power. Uh, and so I guess I'm kind of true Labour. I'm just kind of realised the Tories are the enemy uh, and we have to focus on beating them always first, second and third uh, has to be our effort to make sure that we beat them. Uh, and if we indulge factionalism or groupings or get into to sort of tribes, we take the attention off the Tories, which is what we need to be always concentrating on. Um, you know, Thatcher devastated my generation and subsequent generations. Uh, and I was absolutely determined from that experience to make sure that Labour always won uh, and because we have to be in power, otherwise we can do nothing. So I've been pretty uninterested in those kind of labels, to be honest. What I've been interested in is winning. That label, that label of being a winner is hugely important and that's what I'm keen to be associated with. One of the things I was going to ask you, because you represented this constituency that was abolished and then turned into North East Somerset that Jacob rees Wog then <laughs> won that. But I assume because the demographics and the seat changed or something like that, but people often say, you know, in order to win the next election, Labour would have to go kind of so far down its priority list of seats that it would have to win Jacob rees mogg seat. What do you think of that? Because some people are saying, well, that's not all that unrealistic because you did hold that seat from 97 to 2010. Yeah, well, it's clearly possible because I did that and, and did that three times in succession. But I think... I think we have to be very honest. The last general election result was a terrible result for Labour. Uh, and we have to build trust in order to be in a position to seriously contend and win all the seats before and up to Jacob Rees's Mogg's seat to, to win. Um, can I just, just, Angel, my dog is just crying in the background. So I'm just checking she's all right. That's OK. Sit down there. Good girl. Um, um, How many dogs? I'll let us let people see, but there she is. And Angel is a great asset, but she's learned that coming between the screen and me is is um, how she gets attention from me when I'm doing things like interviews. So, <laughs> so I apologise for that. Um, so coming back to it, I mean, look, I think it's eminently possible, but it's hard work uh, and it takes a, a real determination and a focus and a discipline by the party. Um, you know, Keir is doing exactly the right things, it has to be said, you know, this trust building thing is so essential because I've always believed that Labour values, policies and, and principles are equally applicable to rural areas, semi-rural areas, as well as the towns and the cities. Uh, and we have to appeal to all those communities and understand all those communities and win the trust of those communities if we're to be in government. Uh, I've obviously got a record of doing that, but I, you know, I do truly believe that it's really important that Labour can never be uh, pointed out and say, well, you only represent some parts of society, not others. Uh, and we have to reach out uh, and Keir gets that completely. And, and that lifts me and inspires me. Uh, and I think he's absolutely right about the importance of building trust right across the country uh, so that when we do finally win, it won't be because it suddenly came to us. It will be because slowly but surely we built that trust. We built that confidence. We built that support. Uh, and I suspect that the Tories, uh, although they're basking in their recent successes, I suspect the end road has already started for them. And what I'm absolutely determined is that we make sure that we're ready when they crumble. And I suspect it will be very fast when it does happen, that we're absolutely in a position ready to take power. Uh, and because we won the trust of people so that they know we're ready uh, and know what we're going to do and that they want that and endorse that. 
let's hope that you're right because they have already been in power for such an incredibly long time now. Um, I, yeah, so we had a, a question here from Zoe who said, um, has being the former Wansdijk MP and environment minister helped to generate name recognition for you in the area and has that helped with your campaign? Well, the west of England, for those people who don't know it, is made up of sort of three main council areas, Bath and North East Somerset, which is sort of semi-rural outside of the Bath area, South Gloucestershire, which has some very important towns in it, and parts of the outer Bristol, and Bristol itself, which obviously um, is a mixture, but obviously a big city. Um, and what I'd say is that my experience as a minister certainly helps. I was a rural affairs minister uh, in the Department of Environment. And that understanding of rural communities on top of the fact that my constituency was semi-rural does make a big difference in this constituency, in this big worst of England seat, because, um, you know, you do need to understand what the concerns are of all the communities that make up uh, a constituency that you're fighting for. So I think that experience has been really useful. I used to be a Bristol councillor and an Avon councillor in Bristol area too, so obviously I'm very familiar with what goes on in, in those communities too. Uh, and I've lived, uh, actually I was working out the other day, I've lived a sort of third of my life in each of those council areas. So I really do have a, a really amazing knowledge and understanding of all those different communities. And they're all very good. They all have great assets and strengths as well as challenges that they have to face. Um, but what I, what I do feel is that um, bringing them together is going to be a key part of the Metro Mayor's job. So finding common ground to find common solutions is going to be a very important part of that job. So I do believe that I've done a long apprenticeship. Uh, and as I said, I feel very indebted to all those communities because in different ways, uh, they've given me every opportunity that I've ever had along with Labour governments over the years. Yeah, well, I wanted to ask you about this, this question of bringing, so Keir has been talking recently about bringing Labour closer to rural communities. He's been addressing, you know, the National Farms Union, for instance, and that was a kind of a big moment to, to address them. And I mean, there's a, there's a kind of debate in, in the Labour Party of how best to do that. I mean, do you, for instance, kind of rural proof existing policies or do you actually, is that not enough? Because you actually have to start with rural areas and develop policy from there. And how exactly do you address this problem of Labour support being so, so different based on geographical location and, and type, you know, obviously the massive thing, especially that Lisa Nandy has been talking about in recent years is this massive divide between big cities and small towns. And that obviously you've got all of these different types of places within this area that you're campaigning to win support for. for so what kind of approach do you think Labour needs to take in order to build that trust and make sure that it's not so very uneven? I, well, I think the truth is, and this is my experience as a as once like MP for thirteen years, which has you know had everything in it except in a city, a wide mix of communities, is that actually people are pretty much the same wherever you go. They're you know they're basically decent, uh, and they want to aspire and do better for themselves and their families, but they don't want to do that by putting down other people. They don't want to to be unreasonable or unfair. They want compassion in society. They don't want homelessness on the streets, whether they're you know, in remote rural communities or in, in urban communities. That, you know, what I think is different about those communities and the range of communities is that they see the world through a slightly different prism. So, you know, I might use the word socialism to represent, you know, a compassionate society that cares for people and looks after them. Uh, many rural communities wouldn't use those words, but they'd have the similar values. They would care as much about their communities. They'd want compassion to be part of what was um, going on to make sure that people were treated fairly, that there were people being d done down. So I think that actually it's not about rural proofing anything. It's about recognising all the common things that we have with each yeah. other wherever we live. Uh, good labour policies are equally good wherever you live, frankly. Uh, and that's perhaps what we've got to get out of our mindset. Maybe we have to look at the world in a different way too. It's not just um, that we have to understand how different communities are and understand them, but we have to look at ourselves too in that process. Uh, and I think if we do that effectively, uh, we will build trust because really trust is about relationship building and that's really about listening. Uh, and if you listen well to communities, I think you end up winning, winning their support when you want to go to the polls or when you go to the polls. You're talking about the the incumbent just then, the Tory incumbent earlier, and mm. I mean, your your Tory opponent is changing, isn't he? So the incumbent Tim was not restanding, and actually they've selected Samuel Williams, a new a new Tory candidate. Do you know why 
I mean, someone has asked, do you know why Tim Bowles is running again? And have you met or interacted at all with that new Tory candidate that you'll be opposing? Um, I, I, I haven't actually met the existing Tory um, mayor at the moment. Um, okay. uh, so, and I'm probably unlikely to do that now. Um, yeah. I haven't met any of the other candidates except the Lib Dem one because he was an MP at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were also councillors together at various times in the local area. Um, but the difference, I suppose, between me and the other candidates is that I am truly local, as in I've lived here all my life in the West of England. Mm -hmm. I haven't come in because I came to university or something like that, uh, or came in because of a job. I, you know, everything about me and my life is based on this great set of communities that I know so well. Um, but I suppose, coming back to your question, why has he gone? Um, I genuinely don't know, but what I feel instinctively is he probably hasn't been treated very well by the Conservative Party. Uh, it probably is a sign of their desperation, because I think the last thing any rational party wants to do is change their candidate literally days before an election's being called, uh, which is pretty elections been coming for many years it's not like um parliamentary elections used to be you weren't quite sure when it was going to happen so uh, who knows but he looked like he was expecting to be chosen yes did you sorry dan we're just losing you here we, Sorry, we, we, we did earlier. I mean, one of the things <laughs> we need to talk about broadband policy and, uh, you know, connectedness in rural areas. Yeah, sorry, we lost you there. So I didn't catch any of that. Well, what I said was, I don't think that the. Um, I don't know if you can hear me now. Unfortunately, I just heard that bit, but I didn't hear anything that came before that. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, stop my camera for a bit and just go on voice if that will help. It's because we have very poor broadband, as you and I were talking at the beginning before we started this broadcast. And um, the Metro Mayor hasn't done his job, the Tory Metro Mayor, I hasten to add. In making sure that we have good quality broadband so this will happen about this time when people are all using the internet yeah absolutely um i mean maybe maybe try with video are you like you know right next to your router i don't know how to diagnose that I'm, I'm afraid is not much we can do because it's just um how it is in rural areas i'm afraid uh, and if we're unlucky and lots of people use it at the same time you get this so i do apologize those who are listening in and watching in, um, and I ask you to persevere. <laughs> just like I have to persevere quite often in this way, but I can assure you that a new Labour Metro Mayor will get this sorted very, very quickly, not just for That's the area, right across the area, because it impacts so much on obviously people during the pandemic who need to use the internet more than ever, but also on our businesses, our schools. You know, there are schools who have very poor broadband uh, access, which is absolutely crazy when it's such an important part of uh, children's learning. So. You know, it's a really good example of how practical things are like broadband are really, really important. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's so crucial. Um, obviously, this pandemic has only shown that even more because we have to do all, of, all events like these over the Internet now, over Zoom and, and tools like this one. Um, but anyway, to get back to what we were talking about. Um, yeah, I mean, you were saying that the Tory incumbent, it seems like he wasn't treated very well by the Conservative Party. And it's obviously not a good sign for them that he stepped down in this way. I, I, well, I think that, you know, if you are serious about winning elections, you do not change your candidate unless you really have to. So I, I think we don't really know what's happened because obviously only they know uh, and they news manage whatever they want to say about what's happened. Uh, my feeling is that I actually feel sorry for the guy on a human level because I suspect that he was expecting and intending to carry on and that hasn't happened for whatever reason. Uh, but the important thing is actually not about him or the Tory party. What it's about is what Labour Party offers now uh, to persuade and win the confidence of the voters of the West of England, because it's them who matters, not the Tory candidates or the name of the candidate or why he's not standing. 
uh, or who's taking over. But actually what matters is the people and the communities in the West of England, right across the West of England, who have really much more serious challenges than, uh, than any of the people we've just mentioned. Uh, for example, the broadband that we are, we're experiencing now, but a whole range of other things. And, you know, the Tories have been really, really poor in our region. I mean, you know, whatever we might think about whether or not the Tories have, have put the, uh, a new candidate up or not, what is clear is that the Tory government has let the West of England down really badly. And the budget was very clear about that. So there's a whole lot of, of different um, funds and, and, and things. So there's something called the Leveling Up Fund, uh, there's something called the Towns Fund and the, something called the Community Renewal Fund. Uh, and in all those cases, nothing came to the West of England. So you might well ask, what's the point of a Tory metro mayor? Um, and, and I'm hoping that the electorate will draw the obvious conclusion, which is uh, not much. Uh, and there need, needs to be a time of change and new leadership so that Labour uh, can make a, a real difference to the communities in the West of England that matter so much to me. What are in this mayoral race? What are the kind of key issues that are coming up when you're speaking to people, or when when you're getting emails in from people living in the area? What what are the things that they're most concerned about? Is it national stuff? Is it local stuff? And kind of when you're asking them how they're thinking of voting, what's playing on their minds mostly? Well, I think what is very clear is that public transport is a huge issue wherever you live in the west of England, whether that's in the centre of Bristol or Bath or out in the towns like Chipping Sobbery or Yate or, or Thornbury or Midsummer Norton, all these amazing, wonderful towns, as well as the rural areas, is that it's really hard to get around, uh, particularly if you don't have a car. And a lot of people cannot afford a car. Um, it's as simple as that. So those people are not part of our full society because they're excluded. Uh, and, I, and I think that people feel quite angry and frustrated. I think that that has been made even harder because of the pandemic. People are really feeling frustrated anyway. So to be able to get around and do your shopping, get your food in and, and all the other important things that we're all facing at the moment, um, it's sort of exacerbated and showed how bad, how bad the public transport is. So that is a huge priority. Jobs is another thing. I mean, I think that people are hugely worried about what's going to happen to the economy post pandemic. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, it is very clear that the Tory government have handled the pandemic very, very poorly. We, we as a, a nation pro rata, have lost more lives, uh, more people have been ill uh, than any other comparable economy. Uh, we're bottom of the G9 in terms of that performance. And it's not just obviously the suffering in terms of people dying and being ill uh, and, and all the rest of it. It's actually impacting on our economy too. So. Uh, although there will be a bounce back because, because we've done so badly over the last year, um, we are not going to be in the same position as we were before for a, for a very long time. Uh, and we'll be the last to get back to where we were compared to the other economies in the world. In other words, other countries around the world are going to pull away from us uh, and we're going to be relatively disadvantaged. So that's a really good reason why we need a West of England Metro Mayor and other Labour Metro Mayors across the country making sure that things like skills and training and apprenticeships and business support uh, and supporting high streets and all the other things that really matter to get our economy back on its feet take place uh, really, really rapidly so that we don't lose out and we narrow that gap and then hopefully overtake our competitors around the world to, uh, to have a really thriving economy. Do you think that, I mean, Andy Burnham often talks about how you know, London, politics is just too London centric and too Westminster centric. And he and he often talks about how he's found it quite refreshing being a mayor rather than being in corridors of, of Westminster. I mean, would you agree that politics is too London centric? Do you think that's one of the key problems or would you describe it in a different way? No, I think I think that is true. I mean, I think it's London dominates not just in politics, but in so many ways. I mean, it, we, we have to acknowledge that there's a large part of our population in the UK lives in London and the South East. Uh, and because of that, there's been a whole lot of industry and business. And, and of course, it ends up um, going there uh, rather than being spread out across the whole country. But I think we're poorer for it as a nation um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, firstly, I think we would be more productive. I believe that if we use the talents of all our people all across the country uh, fully, um, we would have a much stronger economy. So I actually think we're disadvantaged by having so much economic activity in one part of the UK rather than spread out. Uh, also, it, it's, it's odd that we're asking people to move to London if they want to do certain things like work in certain fields or, or whatever. That That's nonsensical too. That's 
particularly in a, in a time when we are aware of how bad the climate change situation is and that we need to get zero, net zero CO2 as soon as possible. Um, you know, it makes a lot of sense to spread the workload around the country rather than make it so that people move around to one place and travel a lot more than they need. Uh, also, I just think, you know, the UK has got amazing communities and cultures and, and regions, uh, and we should want to unleash them so that they can fully contribute to the national um, economy and, and, and in other ways. Uh, and it just seems to me that devolution through Metro Mayors and other measures is a great way of, of making sure decisions are made by those who are most likely to make the wisest and best decisions for local areas, and that's the local people themselves. Trouble is, the Tories don't really believe in devolution. I think they kind of got themselves in a pickle. At stages, they thought all oh, devolution would be a good idea, and they created the Metro Mayor um, system. Uh, but they have to go further than that. They have to commit resources. It's not, you know, the, the Metro Mayor is not there to rubber stamp uh, a Tory minister's decision. They're there to make a decision at a local level that's all the better for that local knowledge. Uh, and the Tories, I think, realise that. Um, but I think they're torn at the moment because they're so desperate to hang on to control all the time. And what they have to do is believe in the British people and, and free them and allow them to make the decisions that are, are going to be important. It is a little bit depressing when you think sometimes about how they talked so much about, you know, the Northern powerhouse and then kind of never, nothing really happened with that. And then the last election was fought on Brexit, but also this levelling up pledge. And then, you know, it's, it's kind of history repeating itself and the rhetoric is always there. But then Labour says, well, it's not, not happening in practice, but it just seems like over and over again that the fact that it's that, you know, progress is so slow isn't yeah. cutting through because they have actually broadened their their reach in terms of, you know, getting all those so-called red wall seats, for instance. Yeah. What's yeah. going on there? Well, I think we've got to be careful in this debate that we don't let the Tories set the agenda too much because I think, you know, talking about red walls and what have you, you know, there are good communities right across the country and Labour has a message and an appeal to all of them provided we build we build trust that we have lost. Uh, and I'm very confident we can do that. Uh, but what I think is interesting is the Tories talk about all these terms like levelling up. Well, you know, I just don't believe them, if I'm honest. The way that they are giving money to just certain communities, which invariably end up having Tory MPs when you look at it closely, uh, does suggest that they're not interested in levelling up. What they're interested in, in is influencing voters in seats that they want to keep winning in order to hold on to power. Now, uh, winning is fine, but you've got to do it in a legitimate way. Uh, the Tories, I don't believe, are, and I think there's more and more evidence coming out that they are using government resources um, to try and further their ends. So the, the big investment in the media operation at number 10, that's designed to try and get even more grip of the narrative uh, in the country so that that benefits presumably the Tory government and, and what have you. Um, the there's a whole range of things that the Tories are doing. What I think is more important, actually, is that we make sure that we discuss what we think is important. So levelling up as a concept of equality and fairness is clearly a good one. But levelling up isn't just about a north-south thing. It isn't just about a northern powerhouse and, and southern England and south. It's also an east-west thing. As the west of England, you know, some parts of Bath have unbelievable child poverty, would you believe? And yet people think of it as an affluent area. So it's leveling up and leveling across and leveling diagonally, if you like. That's what we need to be thinking about, uh, not just these simplistic terms that fit into the Tory uh, narrative where they want to keep their grasp on power. We've seen what they do with boundary changes. Uh, we've seen what they do where they talk about they want to be fair and supposedly have the same number of uh, voters in each constituency. But of course, registration has a huge influence on that. Uh, what you've got to have is a really comprehensive regis voter registration campaign. Otherwise, the numbers are all skewed. And of course, the Tories know that in urban areas, people register at lower percentage levels. So, you know, again, it's all about self-interest. So we have to show what we're about. And I'm confident uh, that people will understand what the Tories are about. And then they'll understand what we're about. Uh, and then they'll support us. But we have to work hard. We do have to work hard. There's no doubt about that. I mean, how... I mean, another thing that Andy Burnham has talked about, he said in an event last week that I that I watched that you were in as well, that hmm. the kind of the National Labour Party has not really been there for its mayoral candidates. Is that something that you would agree with? Do you feel like you've received enough support in this mayoral campaign? Yeah, no, I do. I mean, I, I mean, the first person who I spoke to of 
in any length was actually Keir Starmer, who got straight on the line to talk to me. Uh, we chatted for a considerable amount of time. It wasn't just a hello and nice to meet you. It was a, a proper discussion about a whole range of things. So Keir is showing by example that he takes Metro Mayor seriously. Uh, and I think he's absolutely right in that. Um, now, I do think we have to work out what the relationship between our Westminster politicians is and our mayors and our councillors. But I think that should be a constant review because society changes and power changes and how we influence society in a better way clearly changes as those things happen. So Keir is absolutely right to be opening up those channels to have those discussions. Uh, and I'm very grateful that he's doing that because it is a bit overdue. Andy Burnham has a point that, you know, in recent years that hasn't been thoroughly discussed, I don't think. Uh, and it's clear now from what Keir has been saying and what some of his shadow cabinet members are saying, that they get uh, that we need to look at this very carefully and closely to make sure that we are doing our bit by devolution. Devolution is an important thing and it needs to be done properly. Is the whole Metro Mayor thing something that you were kind of instantly on board with? Because Keir has talked about how he actually used to be quite wary of the idea of local and regional mayors and that the COVID crisis is what changed his view of them. Were you kind of always convinced about the importance of these roles? Um, well, I think I am convinced about devolution. And obviously I was part of a Labour government that voted for and introduced devolution to Wales and Scotland and things. So, you know, that's clearly a passion of Labour politicians of that generation and since. But you are always wary when Conservatives bring about um, roles like the Metro Mayor because you're always thinking, well, what's the true purpose? Is this about including a whole swathe of Tory areas outside of our Labour urban heartlands in yeah. order to somehow delight, delay, um, dilute sorry, uh, Labour influence overall? So you are always wary, and, and we know from experience that they are always looking for those kind of opportunities, uh, even though they try and dress it up in somehow a fairness agenda. It isn't fair, as we're seeing with the allocations of money. I mean, it's just absolutely brazen, really, what they're doing. Now, we'll have to see how that unfolds uh, over the coming months. Uh, but I suspect that, you know, they're trying to buy their way uh, to, to by putting various projects in areas that they think will benefit them most. Um, Governments have to be above that and civil servants will frown at that as well. They will not be happy about that. So, um, you know, we just have to keep a careful watch. But I think Keir is right to say um, that something happened over the last few months during the pandemic that showed the true um, strength, if you like, and, and significance of a Metro Mayor role, because it's the soft power that comes with the role as well as the defined powers. Um, it's the ability to set an agenda, to have a discussion about areas that the government might not want to discuss. Um, you know, I think Parliament shuts down things ever so quickly um, uh, at the moment. It, it curtails debates. It doesn't allow debates to go forward. It sort of stops private members' bills very quickly if it's not keen on them. Uh, it does all those kind of manoeuvres to actually stifle debate, not open it up. Uh, and then, um, and, and that's why the Metro Mayor and, and Andy's are really perhaps the best example of that in recent months of, of where we had discussions and debates and thought processes that went on about what is fairness and what is fairness under pandemic situations. And, you know, why is it different in different parts of the country? I, I bet lots of the public hadn't even thought of those things. And now they're thinking, yeah, actually, I can see what's going on. That does seem unjust. That does seem unfair. I mean, I, I find the sort of Tories... Um, and that's why I think we have to focus on beating the Tories all the time. I mean, you know, the Tories will always try and rewrite history. I mean, I remember when I was in the last Labour government, we had actually completely got rid of rough sleeping. There were no rough sleepers. The only people who were sleeping out rough were those with mental health problems who didn't want to come into the, um, the shelters and the various other accommodations that we've made available for, for them. Um, and yet, under the Tory and Lib Dem uh, coalition government, uh, rough sleeping has gone to record levels. And yet I, I almost fainted uh, uh, with annoyance uh, when I heard a Tory minister say a couple of years ago that their objective was to eradicate rough sleeping. Well, the news is that the Labour government did that and you introduced it to record levels with your Lib Dem friends. Uh, uh, so it's absolutely atrocious that they should uh, you know, talk in that way and forget history. And that's part of our job too, is to remind people of what's really gone on. Um, we have to think about the future and tell people what we're going to do and how we're going to do it and why it's a good thing and why it would change people's lives for the better. 
But we also have to sometimes remind people, well, actually, some of these problems were previously solved by the Labour government. They'll do it again, because uh, I'm obviously hoping there'll be a Labour government as well as a Metro Mayor in the not too distant future, uh, because actually it's the communities that matter. It's not us as politicians, it's what the public want and need. We're their servants and, uh, and we have to show that we've got the answers to their challenges uh, and that we care about them enough to deliver them. Yeah, I mean, what you're saying there about about Andy Burnham, I think why the, the reason that they got quite so angry with him and, and how that whole situation unfolded and, and became very personal is because he managed to, with his role, actually kind of control the narrative, which is something that obviously in opposition, Labour really struggles to do, doesn't it? I mean, what, what are the kind of things, if you had been mayor of this last year, or I mean, we're probably going to be living with this virus still and problems with that, for the you know foreseeable future, what are the kind of main things he kind of really concentrated on? Support for self-employed people, business support, and, and kind of poverty during the pandemic. What are the kind of things that you'd really shout about if you had that kind of opportunity to to set the narrative? Well, all those things are important, but I think the things that I would add to those important areas already highlighted by Keir and others in the party is I think things like the homelessness challenge, because I do think there's some really wonderful initiatives that are now taking place because we have these record numbers, unfortunately, again. Uh, and I would want to learn from the experience uh, in Greater Manchester, where they've had some great initiatives at reducing rough sleeping uh, and working in innovative and new ways. Uh, and I'd want to, to make sure that that happened in the West of England too. And I think, I suppose, that's, that's kind of what I would hope if I become Metro Mayor, I will introduce is a, a kind of awareness of where things have been done well somewhere else. I don't need to, and the Labour Party doesn't need to, invent brand new ideas that are wonderful. We hope to do that, but actually I think there's lots of good practice in so many areas, ways of produce, creating new jobs, green jobs in particular, ways of dealing with the, the climate change crisis, uh, making sure we get to net zero. I mean, you know, there are all sorts of technologies, for example, that we should be adopting, we'll need to adopt if we're going to meet our targets in the coming years. But at the moment, there are not enough skilled people to, for example, with heat pumps so that use the, the, um, the air or water to heat our homes. Well, at the moment, even if we had every heat pump we wanted, we wouldn't be able to service them and keep them running because there are literally not enough people trained to do that. So there are lots of very practical things that Metro mayors can be particularly helpful with in that way. So, you know, I'd want to see particularly young people, but people at different stages in their lives also being part of that to make sure that we've got the infrastructure to make sure that we can support things like new forms of heating that are friendly to the environment so that we have a greener and better planet. Um, it's also about biodiversity. I mean, you know, I'm a bit older than you, Sienna, so I have seen, you know, populations of birds and other animals completely affected by the way we use pesticides or um, the way the planet has been affected by climate change. Uh, and I think it's really important that we don't forget that and we do something about it. So I want to see green corridors. I want to see more trees planted. Um, I want a great public transport system, not just because it gets people around in the ways that we discussed, um, because I, I obviously want it to be affordable and I want it to be safe and I want it to be reliable, all those very important things. But it also makes a huge difference to our CO2 targets. Um, you know, and we really have to get on with that. Um, when I was a minister uh, back in 2010 in the Department of Environment, I was told how urgent the environment and global warming was then. Uh, we've moved on 11 years since then, uh, and I think it's even more critical. So I'm absolutely determined to do something about that at the first possible opportunity and with the will of the people of the West of England, that will be happening soon after May the 6th. Holly has uh, asked you, I'm saying she was interested in your plans for transport, particularly the bus network across the West mm. of England. What are your plans there? Well, first of all, we have got to invest a huge amount of money. So we've got to get the money that we need from the government, which they kind of promise and dangle, but haven't yet delivered. So that is very important that we get them to commit to that properly and fully. But we also have to be much more ambitious. One of the things I can say is, uh, having grown up and lived locally in the West of England, is that we as a region haven't been as ambitious as we needed to be, in truth. I think that's partly because in some ways we've had quite a lot of successful businesses and industries in our region. Uh, and I think in some ways that made us complacent. You know, when Thatcher was devastating, particularly Northern England and the Midlands, um, it, it was a wake-up call to those areas and regions to 
have to change what they've been doing traditionally and find new ways of earning livings and, and, uh, and creating wealth. Uh, we weren't quite so impacted in the West of England in the same way. And I think that uh, we have been less ambitious and less sort of hungry to bring about the changes that are needed. Well, I think we're starting to want to catch up uh, with a vengeance, really. Uh, and I'm very excited to buy that, buy that prospect. So, so I think that, you know, public transport is a huge part of that because clearly if you want people to get to the workplace that they need to be at and do their jobs, even with the pandemic changes, which will probably mean we all work significantly more from home uh, and online, even so, we still need a public transport that is completely um, high class, reliable, safe, particularly safe. You know, it has to be able to transport people, um, you know, day and night in a way that they are feeling confident they can use it and, and not be stuck on a bus stop in the middle of, uh, of nowhere, um, particularly in the rural communities where it's even more remote. So we have to you know, produce a robust, reliable, efficient uh, public transport system, mass transport, transport system, uh, and that will require more money than the, the government's going to give. And my fear is as well, is that the Tory government uh, will want to claw back much of the money that it's had to spend on the pandemic. So we might be seeing sort of cuts coming down the line uh, for these things. So it means that a Metro Mayor has to be even more effective at getting resources, not just from the government, uh, but also from elsewhere. Uh, and I think there are great opportunities for investors around the world to invest in things like public transport to make it much, much better. Um, someone on YouTube, Morgan, asks, do you think North Somerset should be should join the West of England Combined Authority? I think it should join as soon as possible, but on the basis that we know exactly what the financial settlement is uh, and we can see that it's a fair one. The difficulty is, is that, let's just put this in context, and, and I'm sorry for those people who don't live in the West of England because this is a bit of a domestic issue, but um, North Somerset chose not to join um, the West of England Metro Mayor area uh, when it was set up uh, four years ago, uh, or five years ago to be more accurate. Um, and so they kind of excluded themselves. So it's not that they have been rejected in any way, they chose not to join. I think now they're seeing that there's great benefits, they wanna be part of the action. And at some level they are partly involved, but not in a full way. So I hope they do join because I think the Metro Mayor has a very important strategic role and it makes complete sense to include North Somerset um, as soon as possible, provided it doesn't mean that the monies that are already insufficient for the West of England are not spent you know, or spread even more thinly in to include North Somerset. That would not help North Somerset or, and certainly wouldn't help the existing councils that make up the West of England. So, so yes, let's hope that happens. Uh, I'd be very keen to bring them in, uh, but it has to be on the basis that there's proper funding for government, that it's not just a, a way of uh, giving out even less, as particularly post-pandemic, when they probably will be inclined to do that anyway. Um, we've got another question, but I think we've sort of already touched on it, but um, Grant asks about how people often see Labour as the party of urban areas and how do we reach out and win back voters in rural communities? Obviously, you're living in one. I mean, do you have any other kind of maybe specific policies or specific recommendations to the leadership or anything like that that you think we really need to kind of draw attention to? Well, I think that I think the key to it, um, I mean, it, this applies everywhere, but particularly, I think, in rural areas because of the remoteness, is I think you have to be accountable and available. And, and that takes a lot of work. So, it, you know, it's hard to do that in urban areas. Uh, and many Labour supporters who live in urban areas uh, and, and party members will know that and, and councillors and, and MPs, you know, that you have to work really hard. It's not um, it's not an easy thing to represent a community properly. But in remoter areas, um, distance gets in the way and makes things that much harder. And you're traveling a long way to get to see relatively few people because they're spread out more. But I think it's just down to a lot of hard work and going out to reach those communities. So I, I think I am a probably a good example of that, having represented the ones like seat, which was semi-rural, um, towns and large, large and very remote uh, rural areas too. Um, and the way that happened, the way that people were able to feel confident in Labour and to vote for a Labour MP who happened to be me was because we went and I went to their communities. I didn't say come to me. Um, I said I'm going to go to you and I would go to the most remote places. It was a lot of work. Uh, I found it very interesting. I felt very privileged to share in their experiences and to find out what their problems were and to, and to get solutions to those problems. But that reaching out process is actually what wins over people's trust. 
uh, because they be they not not just believe it, they come to understand that you really do understand them and you do genuinely care. And, and that's really what politics is about. It's about building relationships, but not any old relationship, good relationships. And, and just as we all know in our personal lives, you build good relationships by investing time in another person or other people or a community uh, and by listening really carefully and respecting other people as well, not just jumping to conclusions and thinking, well, you know, that's what they must mean, but actually asking questions. Uh, when I first started, I had to learn a lot about farming. I knew very little about farming. Uh, and I had to say to farmers, well, what does that mean? And, and what do you do? And what are the challenges? And they would tell me, and I'd, I'd need to listen really carefully to understand it because some of it was quite complicated. Um, but once you've done that, I think people respect you for it. And, um, you know, respect is a two-way street. If you want to be respected by the community, you've got to respect the communities that you want to, to represent. So, you know, I, that's what I'd say. It's a lot of hard work. It's not... Um, it's not different to urban areas. It's just um, a different kind of way of working. When, when I was um, kind of uh, reading about your career, I did come across some reports talking about how you had been like pelted with eggs and ambushed by pro-hunt uh, protesters and the pro-hunt lobby, and you had quite a lot of conflict there. I mean, I don't know if there are any kind of points of tension that are so stark now, so highly charged, but I mean, what was that like? Well, that was about that. Just so people know and understand, that was about the hunting ban, and I've always been a strong believer that that was the right thing to do. I believe that a mark of a civilized society is how we treat animals. In, in one respect, I mean, there's obviously other things too, uh, and and certainly uh, where we don't need to eat foxes, it doesn't make any sense to me that we should we should kill them, and we certainly shouldn't derive pleasure from the process of chasing them and killing them, because to me that says something that's quite concerning. Uh, and I certainly found that when I was a child protection officer, that you know there was often where children were treated badly, there was often bad instances of animals being treated poorly as well. So I think that you know a civilized society, you've got to stand up and be counted. You can ignore these things, but I think you've got to stand up and say what you feel. Uh, and what what I found reassuring, but also very encouraging, was that in rural communities, people felt the same way too. The majority of people living in even the most remote rural communities. Um, don't think that things like fox hunting are the right thing, is the right thing to do. They don't believe that it's civilised. They don't believe it's the correct way to behave. Um, but what's difficult is there is a tradition of hunting in these communities, um, which often tends to be large farmers uh, backing backing those positions um, and some other other things like the Duke of Beaufort in Badminton, for example, who lives in the west of England too. Um, these are traditions. And I understand traditions. I understand why people don't like change. I understand they do things because they were brought up that way. But we all have to ask ourselves, um, I think, as human beings, um, is the tradition that we're following something we want to be continuing in the future? And I think we should constantly be reviewing things all of the time, not just about hunting or the way we treat animals, but a whole range of things. That is what um, building for the future is about. It's about not accepting the past, but actually saying, well, what is it about the past that we don't think is acceptable for the future and, and, and dealing with it. Well, I completely, completely agree with you on that. Um, I mean, the last thing that I was just going to ask you about is really, I mean, kind of people around the leadership have been briefing, have really been managing expectations ahead of these elections, kind of saying, you know, there's this vaccine bounce, the prime minister, you know, the, the economy's unlocking, this is going to be a really difficult one for Labour. And they're actually kind of polling shows gains aren't likely that success would kind of be standing still. But people have been a little bit more positive if out of all the kind of mayoral contests about yours. I mean, The Guardian, I think, described that as the reason being that, you know, because it's more middle class and that's how Labour appeals to people now. I don't know. <laughs> you probably have something to say about that based on your comments of people living in the area in this interview. But I mean, what do you think about the chances of a Labour win in your contest and more broadly in May? Well, well, I think that I have to earn victory and, and I think it's down to the people to decide who's going to be their next West of England Metro Mayor. And I obviously hope it will be me, but I believe that it won't be me for any reason other than they think I will be the best and that Labour will be the best for them and their families and their communities. And that suits me fine because I think we've got a great programme. I think we've got a great new Labour leader uh, and I think we've got a lot to offer um, those communities and those families and those individuals that will improve a lot of their families and, and, and their personal lives and opportunities uh, and will create a fairer society. And I think that is the only thing that matters, actually. 
Um, we can, you know, speculate. I understand politics. Obviously, I understand that um, people will try and guess what's going to happen. All I know is that I have never been in a contest that has ever been easy to win. Uh, I've always fought in marginal seats, whether that was council seats or my parliamentary seat. It was always on a knife edge. And this is exactly the same. I don't think about those things. What I think is what's the program that I believe in uh, and, I'm, and I believe that if I can show that clearly enough to people and explain that in a way that everyone can understand and be part of, uh, I believe that it wins people over uh, and they, and that's important as well. It's not just about winning because that's the beginning. Uh, you know, if, if the Labour Metro Mayor, as I hope will be for the West of England after May the 6th, um, when they come in, they will, you know, they won't be enough that they won. What will be important is that they have the support of all those communities right across the West of England for the years to come, because bringing uh, a really good public transport system to the region, uh, improving opportunities, apprenticeships, helping business, uh, putting the West of England on the map, having green and affordable homes, uh, all the things that we want to see um, will require the public to really understand what the challenge is, because those things can't be done overnight. Uh, and we need public support to be able to deliver that. So. The truth is that I want to unlock, unlock the great talent and potential in our communities because they're going to do the work, actually. I hope to lead that uh, and guide and, and help discussion. But do you know what? They've got a lot of wisdom and knowledge that I will need to listen to and, and, and be aware of, too. Uh, so it's going to be a two-way relationship. Uh, and, and I think that when people go to the polls on the 6th of May, not just in the West of England, but across the country, they're going to be looking for who is going to deliver for them and their families and their communities. Uh, and I believe the answer is Labour. And, and I'm confident that if we explain that well, uh, the public will agree with that and give us the support we need to win. Thank you so much, Anne, for joining us. I mean, the only other thing I will add is, is if anyone is watching and they want to help with your campaign at all, where do they go? How, how can they help you? They should go to my website, um, which is votedan.uk. Um, so if they check me out, they can obviously do a search on the search engine as well. Um, and then they'll go to my website and there's lots of ways that you can help. Uh, you can contribute financially. You can find times to get involved in phone banks. Uh, we're about to start hopefully deliveries very soon as well and get out in the community, which will be really nice. Uh, my sense is that actually because of the pandemic, people are really glad to speak to us uh, and want to hear what we've got to say because they're, they're pretty fed up with how, how it's been for the last year. So they're really glad to have something else to think about and, and uh, consider. So it's a great time to get involved in Labour campaigning. So I'd urge everybody to come and get involved. Uh, check out the website, the, the, the Dan, uh, votedan.uk website, um, and, and look at all the links. Uh, find out a bit more about the campaign. I believe politics should be fun. So I hope you'll see things that you'll enjoy. And, uh, and in fact, Angel is very much part of the campaign who you met earlier on. Um, she's uh, you know, very, very much um, a popular person on my website, if that's the way of describing her. Uh, and I hope that, you know, people who, who tune in will, will realise that, you know, politics hasn't got to be heavy. Uh, it is heavy in some aspects, but actually it's also a lot of fun. Uh, and I want you to come along, uh, enjoy your campaigning uh, and help Labour to a, a very famous victory in the West of England and I hope across the rest of the country on May the 6th. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I do miss the doorstep ever so much hearing you say that. Hopefully, you know, at some point we'll be able to get back on it. Um, Thank you so much for everyone who's been watching this event. We will have more of these. Uh, Louise Haig has repeatedly promised to come on one of our In Conversation events, so hopefully we'll be speaking to her soon. And yeah, stay tuned with Labour List stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Labour List.